Here we have a nice little review from what we covered on Tuesday. First, what are you noticing? Here's a blood vessel. We're seeing laminar flow, the parabolic effect, with the center laminate going with the fastest velocity because all of these other laminates or layers of blood flow are experiencing more drag. Blood will only flow if there's a pressure gradient, a change in pressure along the vessel length. So we would describe that change in pressure by basically subtracting the two. As long as we get a difference of some sort, the blood will be flowing. All right, so describe that. We also discussed the, um, the not items, but we dis I discussed, I taught you Poissouillet's law and what factors influence resistance. Blood vessel length, we don't really think of that as changing from moment to moment. It stays pretty consistent. Blood viscosity, now that doesn't change from moment to moment, but we know it can and does change in ourselves and in patients. We need to be mindful of polycythemia and anemia. Vessel diameter or radius, well that most certainly can change from moment to moment. And that's where we're going to pick up on today. We're going to talk about local or intrinsic chemical signals that can regulate the amount of blood flow through an individual capillary bed. Then we will also talk about extrinsic factors that can regulate blood flow through a single capillary bed. We'll talk about the nervous system and the endocrine system. <coughs> then, I'm going to have to step back and say to you, now, a single capillary bed is different than a whole organism. Systemic flow is going to have a whole set of rules or concepts that we're going to have to master that are slightly different than blood flow through an individual capillary bed. On your lecture exam and lab exam, you will be really careful to use words where your brain will be able to identify, am I thinking of a single, single capillary bed and blood flow, or am I thinking systemically? That's what we have to do, and we will practice that. What would we expect through a single capillary bed versus systemically? Now our systemic conversation will be mo most quizzed upon during class next Tuesday when I tell you about cardiovascular problems. That's when we'll put on our systemic hat. When we're talking about a single capillary bed, well that'll be today. I'm going to show you a lot of the factors that regulate flow through a single capillary bed but also our physiox that we need to review today. Okay, so and we've also played the game with Ohm's law. Ohm's law says flow equals change in pressure over resistance. Okay, can we rearrange that equation? Can we say mean arterial pressure, change in pressure, equals flow times resistance? Yes, we can. And one of the modified slides that I put on Blackboard last night is trying to show you that relationship. So let's go through all that again, but I need to add some more layers. Okay. Let's think about a pipe that changes radius in a series, not parallel, in a series. What does that mean? What should I be thinking of? I want you to think of your garden hose spigot. I want you to think of your garden hose attached to it. Then I want you to think about the end of your garden hose and the various attachments that you can put on it. Can you visualize that your spigot has a wider opening and that the hose is a smaller radius? And depending on whatever attachment you put on the end, you can make it even smaller, correct? So every once in a while, the boys like to go outside and they like to play with chalk. And they draw all over the driveway, which is fun. But after a while, I want it cleaned up because people walk through it and then walk on the floors. And I've got chalk footprints everywhere. So sometimes I'll ask Honey to go out there and rinse it off. 
The man is a genius. He will do any random chore I ask him to do at the poorest quality possible, just so I will get aggravated and relieve him of his duty so that I will take care of it myself. Again, I seem to be in a very sexist mood today. <laughs> Thursday class knows very well. So he will go out there, drag out the hose to the driveway, turn on the water, and nothing attached. <laughs> and I'm watching him. He's just... <laughs> Give me the hose. I'm in a hurry here. Let's get things done. Go in the house and fold the laundry. That was a big mistake. <laughs> okay, so I grab the hose. I put my thumb over the end of the hose. Why? Okay, is it more pressure or is, am I creating more resistance? Okay, so as flow, water flows from your big spigot to your smaller hose to a smaller outlet, the water that's coming in has to be matched with going out. It has to. So what will happen to the velocity as we go from bigger to smaller in a series? It'll speed up. Okay, so what you're seeing here, that as we go from a big aorta to a small capillary, what happens? Well, here's our velocity one. Let's look at this one. As we go from the big aorta to a small capillary, what happens to our speed of blood flow? Slows down. Huh. Our blood vessels obey the same laws as pipes in our house and water flow. <coughs> And yet that's not jiving with you, is it? But how many capillaries do you have compared to aortas? You have about 10 billion capillaries, right? So I want you to think of it like this. If you were to think of a capillary, and this is a, this is a whack job of an analogy, but just go with me on this one. I'm hard pressed for a good one. If you were to think of collecting the capillaries in your body, like picking flowers to make a bouquet, by the time you were done picking all of those 10 billion capillaries, you would have a very large bouquet. You'd have a big collection of stems. And the, <coughs> sorry, the radius of that and diameter of that collection of stems would be much larger than your single aorta. So what I'm trying to say is, as we go from a single aorta we get more <coughs> muscular arteries, and we get more arterioles branching from those, and we certainly get way more capillaries than a single aorta. And we need to consider their collective cross-sectional area. It means we get to add them up. So if we think of a capillary, all the capillaries, sorry, in our body as one single vessel, it would have the greatest cross-sectional area. That means widest. And that means blood flow rate will be what? Slowest. So the more, the more fewer blood vessels we have, blood flow rate, velocity, will have to be faster. The more we have of them, even though they may be very, very small, if we add them all together, they would have the greatest cross-sectional area. Who needs me to do that again? Okay. I'm going to cut out of Taylor her aorta. Sliced it out. See it? About that big? She only has one, correct? I am going to pick out of her all of her capillary beds. And I get all of these capillary beds, and I get... You see them all? If I were to, you can see right through them. See the tubes? And they create one large vessel this big if I were to group them together. Blood, like water, when it flows through a large tube, has the luxury of flowing slower. As water or blood has to move through smaller and smaller tubes, 
Well, what comes in has to go out, so the speed must increase. So, our fewer blood vessels, like our single aorta, we only have one. We can measure its cross-section, its area, its radius. But we have certainly way more capillaries. And if we were to combine them all together and think of them as one vessel, one pipe, they would be very, very large. And just like water, a river going through a wide channel, it's very slow moving, right? But if that river were to narrow down, what would happen to the velocity? Speed It'd speed up. So, okay, what, what do we have in place then for our capillaries? We've got two things going for us. A number one, firstly, arterioles are upstream of capillaries. And they are our resistance vessels. They take away the pulsatile nature of blood pressure and make it one number, right? even keeled, 35 millimeters of mercury. But also, we have so many capillary beds that collectively they create one large vessel. And now the blood at its uniform pressure is also moving at its slowest, which is great for many reasons. Now our capillaries will be shredded to bits and also the blood flow rate will be slow enough to allow diffusion. We can drop off the nutrients and pick up the waste. We can drop off the oxygen and pick up the CO2. Is that better for those of you who raised your hands? Any more questions? Do it over again. Okay. So, if we were to add to this, maybe this will help you. Let each of these circles here represent individual capillaries. We're picking them out of the body and we're accumulating them like those, that bouquet that I said that we're making. And if we actually add them all together, we get a much larger cross-sectional area, which means the velocity, the flow rate of blood through those that larger vessel will be much slower. That's the purpose of this. And that's the reason why we call capillaries exchange vessels. The blood pressure is sufficient enough to keep driving the blood through the capillary, but not too high to shred them to bits because they are only simple squamous endothelium. They need to allow diffusion. Not only are they the thinnest possible membrane for filtration, diffusion, but also the blood flow rate is going to be the slowest to allow that action to happen. Are you okay with that? Okay. All right. Now, an individual capillary bed has intermittent needs. Blood arrives drops off oxygen and nutrients, the blood leaves, picking up the waste. The tissues around that capillary bed, the individual cells, if they could talk, they would say, oh yeah, we need this, we need this, we need this. It does, once the nutrients have been dropped off, the cells have filled up, right? They filled their tanks. It doesn't make sense to keep having blood go through that capillary bed to drop off more nutrients. They can only store so much anyway. So when the tissues around a capillary bed have sufficient oxygen and nutrients, they will have chemical signals that will redirect the blood through a thoroughfare channel. Don't perfuse the entire tissue bed. We don't need all that blood right now. Just beeline it right on out here. When they consume their nutrients and their oxygen, they will release different signals that will say to the precapillary sphincters, you know what? We need our blood now. Please relax. Don't drive the blood through the thoroughfare channel. Let the entire capillary bed be perfused with blood. Sort of like a floodplain, right? When they open the flood channels and they allow the water to go around in the little planes around the channel, 
That's sort of what the pre-capillary sphincters are allowing. More blood to perfuse that individual capillary bed. 